Hi, and welcome to Vault Visions, a panel about the power of genre fiction, what's coming out today from Vault, and what's near on the horizon. I'm Adrian Wassel, Editor-in-Chief of Vault Comics, and I'm joined today by the creators and cover artists behind some of Vault's current and forthcoming series, titles like Barbaric, Witchblood, and The Blue Flame. Uh, this panel is being recorded to be shared far and wide. I'll periodically remind any live attendees who may join us that they can ask questions in the chat, um, which if we have time at the end, we'll get to. Um, before we dive into uh, introductions of all of the creative teams um, and kind of the end little, a little bit about the books, I wanted to say a very special thanks to Yoshi, who is joining us today. Yoshi is one of the cover artists um, that make up our cover artist in residence team and Yoshi has done uh, covers for the Blue Flame and Witchblood, two of the books that we'll be talking about uh, today. So Yoshi, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go team by team um, and that way you can each uh, introduce yourselves. Um, feel free to give yeah. a shout out to any co-creators or collaborators who couldn't make it um, today. And then I'll ask you that you just tell the audience quickly about what your vault series is all about. And that way it'll set the stage for a follow-up round of some kind of deeper, more fun questions where you can get into uh, a little bit more about genre and all that. So I will start things off with um, Michael Marisi uh, and Barbaric. Mike, take it away. Yeah. Hey, uh, everyone. I am Michael Marisi, as Adrian uh, noted. I'm the uh, writer and co-creator of Barbaric. Uh, I also do a couple of other vault books, uh, Wasted Space, um, um, The Plot, and uh, yeah, Barbaric. I was going to mention something that I'm not supposed to mention yet. Uh, and a uh, <laughs> writer of a feature film that's coming out uh, this year called Revealer. But um, thinking about Barbaric, which is co-created with Nate Gooden, who's um, probably one of the best artists alive uh, and one of the best guys around too um and colored by Addison Duke lettered by Jim Campbell uh edited by Adrian uh story about a guy uh his name is Owen uh Owen the Barbarian uh which has a familiar ring uh and, and uh he is cursed to do the right thing see if, if Mike can join back in so Sorry about that technical interruption. These things happen. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand things back to Mike. I think he's back. He seems to be visible, and uh, Zoom is no longer you know throwing him into the phantom zone. So um, Mike, let's uh, let's pick back up with what Barbaric is about. We got to Owen the Barbarian, and then things got crazy. <laughs> Gotcha. That's a good place to start. So, okay, I'll do the lightning round of this uh, so we can move on. I've already spent enough of our time. <laughs> so, yeah, so Owen Barbarian is cursed to always do the right thing, to be basically a moral person, which is a difficult thing to do when you are a barbarian and your life consists of raiding, fighting, finding companions, uh, <laughs> drinking, and stuff like that. So um, he he's joined on his journey. He's got an ax who is a bloodthirsty ax, who is both his moral compass and also uh, his kind of uh, <laughs> the worst moral compass you can have because the more ax kills, he's telling him to kill bad people. The more he kills, he loves the taste of blood. And then he gets drunk. And as we you, most people know, when you get drunk, your judgment gets a little impaired. Uh, so he, he wants more of this, this sweet nectar. <laughs> so, and he you know, kind of gets questionable with his moral uh, guidelines in which to do it. Um, so yeah, it's just a fantasy story, man. You know, it's just like, you know, fantasy is big in so many ways, it's oftentimes big in world building. Uh, you know, you get these doorstopper fiction, which, which I love and Adrian loves too, but it's like, it's kind of taking that tradition in a way, like turning inside out. It's like, instead, if we just forgot all that stuff, just, you know, you don't even worry about it. Like instead make it big and like characters and, and violence and, uh, you know, like, uh, make it, make it sexy, make it fun, you know, just make it so us in all these like crazy kooky ways and, you lean into the fantasy tropes for that and that's really what we did we, we've been having a blast uh i i this is kind of like the most like i feel like it's like the, most, the easiest book that we, we've ever done i mean granted that's a testament to the art team who's just like flawless and just kind of churning along but like 
I don't know. We're just throwing stuff out there and seeing what sticks. And it's been a blast. So far it sticks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Barbaric comes out next month and reception in advance has been incredible. Everyone's really, really excited. And it's been really fun to see the whole first book wrapped um, and be able to yeah. kind of hear from <clears throat> friends and fellow uh, pros um, about the whole thing before it even comes out. I will kick it over to um, Matt Ehrman and Lisa Stirl, uh to kind of take over. Introductions, which blood, what's it all about? Hey everybody, uh, I'm Matthew Ehrman. I'm the writer and co-creator of the brand new hit series by Vault Comics, Witch Blood. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm Lisa Stirl. I'm the co-creator and the uh, interior artist, along with uh, Gab Contreras, who is our wonderful colorist. Yeah, um, and we've got Anne Design doing our letters, and Yoshi does uh, our variant covers, which are incredible. Um, Witch Blood is a neon uh, adventure fantasy uh, about a witch named Yona uh, on a motorcycle, and she's being chased by blood thirty uh, bloodthirsty vampires that are also on motorcycles. <laughs> and it's in the American Southwest, and it's really a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. I think it's got something for everybody. Yeah, full of supernatural uh, insanity. Vampires, and... go, uh, uh, witches, obviously. Uh, cactus plants, um, tumbleweeds, <laughs> <laughs> motorbikes. We got it all, baby. Yeah. Seven things, we have it all. We've got um. all seven things that are required in the narrative uh, lineup of what a story needs to be successful. There you go. <laughs> Who needs exposition, rising action when you- None of that's necessary. Yeah, we got tumbleweeds. We got tumbleweeds. We got tumbleweeds. <laughs> what else do you need? Just slot those in where <laughs> they need to go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I will now turn it over to um, Christopher Cantwell, Adam Gorham from The Blue Flame. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm the writer, co-creator of Blue Flame. Uh, created it with Adam. Uh, who is the incredible artist on the book. Um, our colorist is also Kurt Michael Russell, who is fantastic. And then um, I'm going to have to say Hassan's full last name. I'm going to try. Hassan Atsmani Elahou. Somebody got that for me best. I apologize to Hass if he's watching. Hopefully he's not. Um, <laughs> our, book, uh, our book, Blue Flame, is, uh, is at once kind of a, uh, a very... Silver Age cosmic uh, superhero story um, about the fate of humanity weighing on the shoulders of one cosmic superhero named the Blue Flame, um, aka uh, Sam Browsem, uh, who we also follow in his normal mundane life as a boiler repairman in uh, Milwaukee. And, and in Milwaukee, he is uh, living a kind of more mundane existence, but is still a, a, a a kind of DIY hero that calls himself the Blue Flame and is a member of a, a small vigilante group called the Night Brigade. Um, and uh, those two stories are bifurcated and going along simultaneously throughout the book. And, and then as our story continues, you start to see elements of both bleed into uh, the other. Um, and uh, yes, we have no cactuses or tumbleweeds, so we're um, but we're hoping around <laughs> issue three we work some in. Um, I got to talk to Adam and Adrian about doing some revisions, but um, we're on our way. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Adam. Anything to add? Uh, just that I have a lot of fun drawing this book. Um, I could draw superheroes in space all day, and. Uh, I can draw very sad looking men in bars all day. So luckily <laughs> I get to do both every day. Um, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm, it, it's a real joy getting to work on this book and telling simultaneously really large grandiose stories and very down to earth and human stories. Um, so it's, it's a full balanced meal as far as my artistic duties are concerned. And I'm having a wonderful time working with my team. So Chris, Kurt, Haas, Adrian, uh, it's it's just a it's a wonderful time for me on this book. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you and the entire team. Um, I want to uh, 
give you, Yoshi, a chance to introduce yourself as well, um, because you have done covers for both the Blue Flame and Witchblood. Yeah. Hi, I'm a Yoshi Oshitani, and I am a concept artist and illustrator. And yeah, I've been asked to do a whole bunch of covers for Vault this year. I'm super excited. Um, yeah, it's been really great. It's, it's a little nerve wracking doing comic book covers where you're trying to encapsulate, you know, everything that's inside the issue um, in one image and get people really excited about uh, what's on the inside. But it's also really exciting because I've been able to see some of the previews before anyone else. I'm very excited about that. Um, so yeah, it's, I get to get to see the sneak peeks and uh, I can't wait for everyone else to read the rest of the series too. Well, your work has been um, exemplary. Uh, I can't wait to ask some questions because you've done some things with these covers that are just crazy um, cool. These connecting covers are amazing. So we'll get into that um, shortly. I'm gonna come back around to the Witchblood team and ask some more pointed questions now that um, you know the stage is set. So obviously husband wife team that's different than in a lot of other uh creative teams and i wanted to ask a little bit um first what that process is like getting to um be in the same space everything's remote especially during the pandemic um but in a way you two have more of a old school um like in the same drawing room kind of um setup so i wanted to ask about that process yeah, no, it's, uh, we do literally work in the same studio, yeah. uh, same room of the house. And um, it's great because it makes the collaboration process so seamless to the point that we are often, you know, helping each other brainstorm or, you know, come up with ideas or uh, help out with issues that we're having, whether it's with some dialogue that Matt's not sure about, or I have like a panel layout that I'm not sure if it's working. Yeah. And it's just so nice to be able to just literally turn around and be like, hey, what do you think of this? You wrote too many tumbleweeds in this script. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I Can can't I draw... cut some tumbleweeds? <laughs> I need to cut some of these. <laughs> no, uh... <laughs> but 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 really though, it's um it's one of my favorite parts of comics yeah. is just uh the the uh the the teamwork that goes into creating it and to be able to feel kind of the ownership of like not only am I the artist but I really do feel like a co-creator yeah. in the world that Matt and I have built together with Witchblood so yeah, yeah I mean it's the, the, the immediacy of being able to get feedback on an idea and not have to wait through like email or wait for uh, Adrian to <laughs> respond to me. I could just turn to Lisa and be like, what do you think of this idea? Is it stupid or is it bad? Or do you want to draw that thing? And she'll be like, no, I don't. And I'll be like, okay, <laughs> we'll move on. And uh, it really it really helps make the, the creation process of the book. Like it's really fun and it's really fast. And um, that's, those are sometimes two things that are not mutually exclusive in comics. Yeah. yeah. Um, so other than tumbleweeds and motorbikes and vampires, uh, what, you know, what's the DNA of witch blood? Because I think if there's one kind of maxim I've had in my head as an editor on this series, it's like expect the unexpected. And I know that's trite and terrible, but it's totally true for this. Um, you've thrown people into the deep end with this world and you basically just want to see if they can figure out how to swim. So I was, <laughs> I was thinking, um, you know, if you like unpack that a little bit, what's the DNA, um, what inspired which blood, um, and what made you both decide this had to be the next thing you do together? Because, um, you know, you've also done Long Lost together, which was a phenomenal uh, series, but very, very different. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so I, as far as the DNA of Witchblood, I think, you know, to boil it down to like the sweet and condensed milk of whatever it is, it's, it's all of the fun, like, fantasy that I, that both Lisa and I took in when we were kids. Like, I grew up playing a lot of video games. And I, I think that's where a lot of my uh, foundation for storytelling came from as a kid. Like, I love Zelda and I love how, you know, 
uh, you're just put down into this fantasy world and you have these these uh, uh, little tidbits that you can hang on to that you know. It's like, oh, sword and shields. Oh, there's goblins. But they subvert so many different things to make it their own. Final Fantasy does that a lot too. It, it, it mashes so many genres and elements. And I think that's one of the really... In, not, it, it's one of the things that I really love to do is, is take things that are different mediums like video games and, and music. Music is another huge inspiration and, and try to make those work as the major inspiration for how we tell the story. Yeah, and as far as like why Witch Blood was the next thing we wanted to create oh, together, yeah. um, I specifically like when we sat down to figure out what our next project was going to be. I was like, I want to do something that's totally different from Long Lost. Yeah. I want to do something that's fast paced, that's full of action, that's challenging me as an artist in a way that I've never challenged myself before. And and of course, then we got to talking about like, oh, uh, I mean, because Matt always asks me, you know, whether it's by issue or at the start of this whole thing, like, what do you want to draw? Yeah. And it, yeah, I was like, um. I would like to draw witches, please, and lots of magic, wonderful, crazy things. And uh, you came up with the vampires. Yeah. And then it just kind of really organically came together once we had the witches versus vampires. And we're like, this is simple, but yet there's so much we can do with it that yeah. we, you know, that feels new. Yeah, it, feel, it really feels like the main ingredient of this series has been to really distance ourselves from having to say no to anything. I think there's only been like a few cases. There's a character that I wanted to name Tony Joe, and Lisa was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I think that's really one of the only times that she, that, any, that anyone has really said, you know, straight up no to anything on, on this book. It, it's, been a, it's, it's been a really fun, creative way to subvert some and genre be, yeah and because it's such kind of a fast-paced story that also follows sort of a road trip format mm -hmm. you just get to go to so many places and meet so many characters and see so many aspects of the world and kind of a uh, uh a quick way yeah. and um it's and, it's, yeah. it's world building through the road trip uh lens yeah or the the formula or whatever that is mm -hmm. yeah um, I think that's been one of the most um, fun kind of facets of the story from my perspective as an editor is just kind of reminding you that anytime you want to, you know, literally get, you know, wheels on pavement and move to the next yeah. place, you can um, and continue to subvert those expectations um, of what the story is about, what, what the rules of the world are. There are some things coming and in, in issues six through 10 um, that are going to change how everyone sees the entire world that they feel like they just figured out. Yeah, um, and really I love that excited. about the series. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that about the series. We I, love to keep the audience on their toes. I I'm, I'm, I, I'm not afraid as a creator and as a writer to, uh, I don't know how else to put this, but alienate the reader <laughs> in the hopes that that kind of alienation will make them, will break them down and keep them on track to continue reading. If that makes sense. <laughs> I want them to feel... <laughs> the book's great, everybody. Please buy it. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to turn things over to Yoshi um, to ask uh, about the covers that you've done for um, Witch Blood. So uh, uh, in our Cover Artists in Residence program, um, you, I believe, are the only artist who's decided to do connecting covers across the entire series which lends its whole own special like puzzle to solve. And I wanted to know um, what m made you decide to do that? And then um, what did you attach to in Witch Blood specifically that was like that, that kind of kernel that you're like, okay, this is the thing. This is the thing that I'm gonna use to kind of grow this entire connected cover series. Yeah, I mean, well, it started off cause I got asked to do uh, Witch Blood, the first cover, I was like, I read it. Um, I was like, this is awesome. Some of the thing, visuals that I really loved was like the bright pink that's used in a lot of the logos. Um, a lot of uh, the bright pink that's used as a depiction of blood. I love that. Um, and then also, you know, reading about like, it's got a Southwest vibe. So I really love Southwest patterns and a lot of that iconography that comes there. I was like, this is great. Um, I want to incorporate some of this into that. Uh, and then, you know, afterwards I got asked like, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could do like the rest of the covers for like this series? I was like, 
yes, well, if I have the the bandwidth and the breadth to do that many, why not do a connecting set? Because then you can really want to collect each issue. Um, and then it's also just really fun to kind of like see them line up um, and have a story revealed to you with each issue that you get. Uh, yeah, and so I don't know, it was just really great. And I was like, what if I did three? Um, and then the the idea came. I was like, well, why don't you just connect all five? And I'm like, uh, for uh, for the first arc, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. I'll do that. And then for uh, the next arc, and um, yeah, and then of course, uh, that was when I started working on the blue flame covers. And uh, the the question came up. Well, why don't you do connecting covers for these ones too? And I'm like, oh, well, that's great. Um, this will be perfect. I would say the one thing is is that it is so much work on the initial setup. But, um, but then when it comes to each individual issue, it's a lot easier to do because I've done so much work for myself ahead of time. Um, but yeah, I know, like, like I said, it was really great with Witchblood um, getting to talk with these guys about um, what's gonna happen in the series. And, you know, like I said, spoilers, I can't reveal anything, but there was one cover that I was like, wouldn't it be great if I drew this? And Matt and Lisa were like, well, it would be, but uh, this is no longer going to be relevant by the time that that issue comes around. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I said, no spoilers, but like where they're going with this really unexpected. I'm super excited for more readers to read it. Um, and yeah, and I hope that people really enjoy the covers and I get that same sort of like hyper energy that's within the comic where I don't know, there's just like so many cool characters that show up and uh, I just really wanted to keep drawing the homages on the covers to them. I was like, this is my favorite character. I definitely have to make sure that I draw her. So yeah, it's been great. Well, it's it's turned out in, in I mean, it's, it's incredible and you've managed to make um, individual covers that are all each phenomenal, but they work as sequential as themselves. They reveal in a way, as you were talking about the story um, they have a story to the to the structure of the covers, which is um, just one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to you know see um, and be a part of as an editor um, because it's a I think it's a it's a rarity in comics to do that um, and to see that. So thank you very much. Um, I am going to circle over to uh, the the Blue Flame team and um, ask some more uh, pointed questions here. So. Um, the first one is the obvious one, the big question, um, which is how do you how do you make a new superhero, right? In comic book space is comic book space is you know dominated by heroes, and you know Chris, you've written some of them, um, some of my favorites and some of my favorite runs. Adam, you've drawn some of them again, some of my favorites and my favorite runs. Um, and then you both decided that you were going to make an, a new one <laughs> and make it relevant to now. And um, that's a huge undertaking. And I wanted to ask the obvious question, which is where do you start with that? Where do you start with the, the creation of a new icon? Boy, yeah, I mean, I, I will, I'll, I'll go on to something you just said, Adrian, which is making it relevant to now. I think that's where the idea started, right? Which is, um, you know, I can see a, a couple of us, even like Michael and Adam and, and behind my computer station here, uh, you know, I've got a bunch of toys and, and books and stuff that inspired me that I loved since I was a kid. Um, but it, for me, this idea really came out of um, that question of superhero relevance. And, and, you know, there is such a contrast, I think, to be explored that we're trying in our book between um, the escapism of, of the superhero, the ideal of the superhero, and how, how it works as a construct in story and in our culture, and then also just um, the oil and water of that sometimes with our culture and with our reality. And, and the, the crux of the book, for, for me at least when I started crafting the idea, was, was are superheroes still relevant? And that was kind of the thesis question for the book. Uh, was was are can they still be relevant um, or are they going are they in danger or in threat of being kind of washed away by the tidal wave of crises that we're experiencing um, you know on the planet uh, big and small right whether it be your daily life um, your individual kind of internal you know tape that's running versus you know <laughs> giant pieces of glacier falling off whatever it is right there's all of these things and 
even someone, you know, take the, you know, most classic of superheroes, someone like Superman can't be there everywhere at once. And so that idea of the individual um, tirelessly, selflessly helping, um, it's just eventually it's not going to be enough, right? You, you can't save everyone. And so I think that was a question I wanted to explore in this book. And then, and then in terms of the visual style, I, I, I just drew a lot from this stuff that uh, inspired me, you know, in the initial kind of uh, putting it down on paper and then turned it over to Adam. And then, you know, Adam took it and ran with it. And, and the stuff that, you know, you guys have done, you and Kurt have just been so remarkable in bringing it to life. It's more than I could have ever hoped for. Um, and I, I, it, I found myself getting more excited by the blue flame in cosmic space than I think I initially planned to based on the way I wanted to craft the story. So um, I don't know, Adam, I'm sure you want to talk about that, but it, that's been a pleasure to see. Oh, <laughs> that's nice to hear. Um, I, I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> no, I muted myself. Apologies, Adam, Adam. For you, the, Adam. <laughs> the, for okay. you, Adam, the question. The, the question is, um, how do you approach starting um, the character design of a new icon, uh, the iconography of a superhero? Most superheroes that anybody is going to be drawing are either, you know, well-established designs or iterations of really known iconography. You know, you bury the Superman S in the sand and 10,000 years from now, if there's anybody still here in their sand, um, you know, somebody will be like, oh, that's a Superman S. Um, and you have to try to solve that problem with the brand new you know, character with that, with the genre of icon like that. Well, it, you know, it began with Chris's initial, uh, his scripts are very vivid. Um, and so I felt the key in the ignition. Um, so I was able to uh, really see what he was going for in terms of the broad sense. Um, and then for me, it was really just assembling uh, the details and these things out. And, um, you know, it's not easy work books I've done, but of creating a character that didn't just feel new, but also felt familiar because when the book starts, the blue flame is a, has been in action for uh, some time before we meet before we meet up with him. So it was trying to capture this sense of familiarity and that this is a character who is uh, already lived in. And part of that was just playing with um, with, uh, with looks that we've, we've seen before while also trying to make them feel fresh. Um, and uh, playing with like, even just like, you know, with different hues of blue was, was an interesting challenge and, you know, uh, getting some chrome in there to, to shake things up. Um, so, you know, like I, I pulled from a lot, obviously, like I looked at what was out there. I looked at things, characters and, and you know, looks and costumes that I, personally love that I feel stand the test of time and you know there's characters you know uh, like you know Spider-Man, Superman, Batman who they go through costume changes but they all kind of revert, revert back to the looks that they started with so you know uh, I had to look at like why that was and um, you know we one of the wonderful things about coming up with the Blue Flames character design was that I had input from the entire team. So, you know, like Chris, of course, uh, Kurt on colors, Tim with design aspects and and, and how functional his suit uh, had to be and or, or how, you know, not functional it had to be, you know what I mean? Like you, you know, we, uh, you know, we, there's an abundance of superhero movies where these costumes are, are they have to be designed in a way where they look where they make sense and look cool in a real world and i think that maybe that saturated uh uh you know the comic books a little too much where where costumes are a little overwrought with like lines and seams and stuff like that so i decided to take a route where it was a little you know more streamlined more fit to the body and you know not worry about how sam gets this on or off you know uh, <laughs> 
So, I mean, like there were practical things like where, you know, he, in the story, he removes his helmet, he removes his gauntlets, but, you know, like I, I, I let go of, of, of the things that I guess I've been inundated with and just got back to just a really uh, Silver Age uh, costume that's more fun to look at and, you know, don't worry about really <laughs> the, the logistics of putting this thing on and wearing it around or, you know, like I, it may be like skin tight, but of course it works in space, you know, because it, <laughs> it has to. Um, and then, you know, once I was able to kind of like loosen up in that regard, the suit got really fun and I fell into it and it just became easier to draw and more natural. And then of course there's Sam's, you know, do-it-yourself suit when he's back on earth. And um, that aspect of it became really fun because uh, the spirit of that is like, you know, Sam is literally just a dude who wants to be a hero. And so his costume has a little more flair, like his collar's popped. He's got this fun motorcycle helmet. He almost kind of looks like that uh, uh, 80s Captain America TV movie version, right? You know, like <laughs> there's, he's, you know, he, but he's got this like, you know, he's got this swagger about him. And, we, you know, we see that in the first issue where he's kind of the hometown hero. Um, so, you know, the, that was, uh, those were the two, two modes of looking at these costumes. And I'd like to, I, I now feel like, you know, being into the series as far as I am now, I feel like I've really uh, grown into the costume and it's, it feels second nature to me. Well, it's, um, it's clearly inspired, uh, a lot of other artists who've seen a, a huge uh, number of fan art pieces for the Blue Flame, um, and no. the book just and the book just came out. Yes, what yesterday? I have lost track of time. I've posted so many panels now, but um, <laughs> yeah, it just came out yesterday. It's an incredible, incredible um, reception, and so all of that work that you've put in crafting the two different kinds of suit, the do-it-yourself and the cosmic suit has clearly paid off because readers are responding to it, artists are responding to it um, and they're generating and iterating their own. And I feel like that's always the clearest um, marker, the clearest testament to the work is, you know, if it's an icon then other people want to, you know, draw it as well. And um, so, you know, applause to you for doing, for, for tackling the impossible and doing it so, so well. Um, oh, well, thanks, thanks. It's, it's definitely, it's a thrill to see, yeah. Um, and the variants for it as well, like Yoshi, like I love your variants. They're, uh, I, like I, I adore them, they're so great. And I love the, the you know, the Night Brigade in the background. Uh, it's, uh, I feel very lucky to have these variants and, and see other people's uh, takes on them. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. Well, that, cues you up Yoshi to talk about what it was like um to uh you know tackle the blue flame a new superhero and um I just wondered what what sort of visual um inspirations you brought to your cover which once again is five connecting covers but in a very different sort than the the than um witch blood so I just thought you can maybe talk a little bit about that and what um what visuals inspired your your cover line yeah, I mean, definitely for this series, the thing that is the most interesting is the, the two parallel worlds that are happening simultaneously that are, you know, interconnected, they're inspiring each other, there's a little bit of like, which is the actual reality that's happening, that kind of, that blending that you're not super sure is the reader what's happening. Um, so, you know, trying to capture that energy into the covers is like, you know, <laughs> Oh no, like a single image to capture these huge complex image or ideas. Um, but you know, like I really like the the imagery of um, you know, going into space kind of has that retro 1950s futurism vibe and feel to it. And I really love that. Um, so yeah, definitely looking at posters and iconography and imagery from that era. Uh, you know, it's, because it's from an era where um you know, things are much more like uplifting and you're like, oh, I'm so excited for the future. What is this hold? What are the possibilities? Which is a nice contrast to the blue flame where, you know, the ideas are, you know, hopeful, but also kind of 
super pessimistic we're like maybe this isn't great maybe it is i don't know like it kind of has that <laughs> nostalgia like times used to be better why aren't they good now i don't know there's there's a lot of stuff happening there um and i don't know if the the images for two three and four have been released publicly yet um <laughs> oh no okay well i'm super excited talk, talk about them yeah talk about them all you want though <laughs> yeah oh also well um you know we, we went obviously between us and uh in the cover team went back and forth on the visuals on that a bit um but i'm really excited for you know the solution that we came up for with those where um you know it's got this like super optimistic space scene in the background that's connecting all the covers um and then a little window in the middle that is kind of a vignette to the mundane world that these characters are living in um and yeah and i think that that contrast is really exciting um or in a very very quiet way uh so i'm really excited and i hope that these like little vignettes can kind of capture the mood of the book series um or you know the comic book series i'm really excited i think uh it's really awesome. And like I said, being able to read some of the scripts. Uh, I will say also, I got to read some of the scripts before I had seen any of Adam's artwork for it. And I remember reading it being like, man, I wonder what Adam's gonna do for this. Like, good luck. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> I'm like, wow, he pulled that off so well. This, this is incredible. So yeah, it's been really exciting. Um, but yeah, I'm, and like I said, I can't wait to read uh, six through 10 and also do the covers for those as well. Yeah. Well, uh, again, the um, covers that you've done for the Blue Flame are extraordinary and sort of unlike anything else I've seen, those vignettes that you were talking about, um, you created a cover within a cover in, in a way, and you created a second frame, which again is like you're doing sort of sequentials on covers, which is brilliant. And um, I'm really excited for, for the world to, to see those, um, which will be unveiling after the US Book Show. So. Um, I can't wait for everyone to see all of those. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, Michael Marisi. Um, let me just check the time real quick. Um, yeah, we should be good for time. So um, Mike, the I, I won't call you our resident genre expert, but, um, or maybe I will, whatever, at my own peril, I'll call you the vault genre expert, right? You've done, um, you've done it all here. You've done sci-fi, and now you have uh, fantasy um, with with barbaric. You've done horror, and I've heard you talk about this in the past. But I wanted to kind of just ask you about genre specifically. What you think you can accomplish with genre? You've run Wasted Space, which is our longest running series at Vault, uh, twenty five issues. Um, the final arc is is soon to come out. Um, you and that's a sci-fi story now you've got barbaric and i know our ambitions are high and we're hoping to run that for a long time though the kind of formula to doing so is a little different um and you did the plot which is an eight issue series and that's horror and um i see connective tissue between them especially wasted space and and barbaric and i was hoping that you could talk about um what you're able to accomplish with genre um and, and how you use genre as an access point, because I know that's something that's been really um, important to you and vital to your um, time at Vault. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely integral to my time uh, at Vault. It's, um, you know, I'd say it's uh, integral to my life, really. You know, like I, I still remember, um, I still remember the day or the time rather that uh, my high school English teacher gave me a copy of, uh, uh, of Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Sirens of Titan. Uh, it changed my life. Um, and I think from there, you know, it was a rabbit hole of many other similar writers of, you know, Ursula Le Guin and Bradbury and uh, Huxley and things like that. And then eventually I'd already ex explored, uh, you know, horror cinematically, but um, I think at that point is when I really started to learn, you know, the power and the strength of what genre does and, and superhero uh, fits in this uh, comfortably as well. And I think, you know, Chris and Adam are doing this tremendously. It's a tremendous book. And I, and I want to express that to both of you. It's amazing. Um, but, you know, one of the things I really like, at least my personal um, 
approach to genre is is to do two things is to be instructional in some way and to be entertaining in some way you know and i think that's what i like to keep if i'm setting my target it's to do those two things to have something to say um that's what genre does best we can trace this back to you know twilight zone be before twilight zone whatever where there's this there's message there's this something culturally or politically or philosophically or whatever and then you kind of put it in this package that's very fun and very entertaining you know i don't think you know, we live in this, you know, genre, I think, I think storytelling is one of the most important things on this, this planet. I think stories are, are the things that bind us together that help make us human and understand the human experience. And I think storytelling and what genre does is more important than ever in a world where people are, are screaming, you know, messages at each other, literally through social media and talking heads and all this kind of stuff. And nobody learns that way. You know, you'd never learn by someone telling you how stupid you are, <laughs> you know, like nobody's ever learned anything that way. But the beauty of storytelling, the way that genre endures is that it takes those important points and it makes them digestible. It makes them feasible. That's something you can absorb, something you could take in. And after the fact, after you've done, gone on this entertaining, fun, uh, exciting, adventurous journey, you look back, you say, oh, wow, there was something else there too. I mean, we've talked about this, Adrian, like Bradbury, for example, is the master of this. That's why his work is endures, that you can read Fahrenheit and you look at that and it's a, it's a thrilling, amazing story. And underneath that it is really important things that stand the test of time uh, to, to today. I'm not saying what I've done is anywhere near that. I hope one day, but, you know, Waste of Space, I try to do that. You know, plot was plot was a little bit more intimate in that and a little more personal to me. Um, but still, I think there's some universality about mental health, uh, about, you know, dealing with, you know, troubles and generational troubles and families. Um, and Bear Barrick is like that, too. It's wrapped in a very, in the most bombastic package I can probably ever conceive. Um, but there's still stuff underneath that about like, how do you be good? What does it mean to be good? You know, what, how do we do these things? How do we do this thing called life? And genre fiction does that so incredibly well and so incredibly powerfully. And um, I'm lucky to have done it. I'm lucky to have done it with Vault and have such great people, Adrian, like yourself, Damien, Tim, Nate, um, around me. And, um, you know, I hope to do it for a very, very long time. Well, I hope to continue working with you for a very long time as well. I, you know, I see um, Wasted Space as this beautiful marriage of um, highbrow philosophical, um, it's almost like a philosophical novel, right? But then it's married with this like kind of lowbrow, really fun hijinks. And this, the, the, the core of that is how do you kill the, how do you kill God? How do you kill a literal God? And then beneath the genre, how do you kill the God that lives in your head that tells you not to like certain kinds of people to, you know, fear certain kinds of actions to live certain ways? How do you kill ultimately a thought and how insidious is a thought? Um, and that's, I mean, that's huge. It's a huge thing to tackle, but you've done it through genre and you've made it literal. How do you kill God? And then in barbaric, you have a similar kind of thing happening, which is, oh, and the barbarian is, you know, he, he's he's terrible he's terrible but he has he, he has an axe uh that is his moral compass and you've created this really fun sort of genre access point to uh a question which is like how do you even create a moral compass for yourself how do you evaluate good and bad actions can violence ever be good um can that kind of action result in goodness and those are huge questions that to tackle but once again, you've created a genre access point of a barbarian with a cursed axe. He has to do good now. And that to me is the power of genre. And of course, all of you do it far better than, than I, you know, like I ever could. And that's, you know, that's the, you know, and that's the joy of being an editor is working with, um, you know, having that kind of 30,000 foot view on and seeing each of you tackle these problems in the same, the same way. Um, you know, we just, we talked about how the blue flame handles this and makes, uh, you know, tackles questions of like heroism now and, and are superheroes still, you know, can, can they still even really be, exist? can they still even really exist? Are they relevant? And then which blood does this, you know, sort of constant subversion of tropes by taking an 
almost every genre I love and marrying them together to try to create something entirely new and it works and it works brilliantly. And that's the thing that I love about Witch Blood so much is that it's saying like the, the access point for genre being like the way into these big problems is also kind of like this, this uh, it's, it's sort of this ex expansion, right? It's like, we're gonna take one um, genre and we're gonna show that as an access point. And when you think you've known everything about that, what vampires are, what witches are, we're gonna change the rules. And we're gonna show you that genre is not pigeonholed, that it is ever evolving. Um, and and I adore that about um, witch blood. So I'm really just singing all of your praises um, before you know, I kind of... Uh, <laughs> uh wrap things up because I'm, I'm looking at the time and um, we've got another panel coming up here um soon so i really just wanted to uh close by saying thank you um to all of you to matthew lisa adam chris michael yoshi um again thank you thank you for joining us which blood is out now it's running in single issues uh the collection will be out uh next year um blue flame uh likewise has just debuted um and has uh is coming out now uh it's brilliant um phenomenal reviews please check it out and the collection will be out next year uh and barbaric um has is is on the horizon so it is you can still it's still available for uh pre-order um so if you are watching and you want to pick up a book about a cursed barbarian who has to do good please uh please call your shop put in a pre-order um all of this and more is like available in our u.s uh book show virtual booth to check out their links to all sorts of cool stuff previews uh downloadable assets you can get bookmarks and wallpapers and there's a score for the blue flame and there's just all sorts of crazy cool stuff um for all of these uh series um so please uh check them out and you can digging into the vault catalog and assess the, the merits of genre yourself um, based on all of these folks' incredible work. So thank you very much again for taking time out of your day. I appreciate it, everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks.